So how much did you <coughs> sell your first bottle of wine for? Um, if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, $16 a bottle. 16 For Ridgecrest Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. 1990 vintage. 1990? Mm-hmm. And where did you sell that? Was it here? Uh, here in Oregon. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 To, uh, to direct consumers. So if you could give me, like, maybe like a two-minute history of what Siren called you to, uh, to the wine. Um, the Siren was probably something coming from... Uh, um, from the right brain, something that basically said uh, uh, that there is something unapproachable uh, except through uh, a more romantic side. I'm a chemist by education, but I also uh, carried uh, an English degree also away at the same time from the university, and so it's it's always been uh, kind of a balancing act and in a somewhat schizophrenic way have always bounced back and forth between right brain and left brain activities and so my left brain is very skilled uh, and rational and very um, um, very ordered uh -huh. and yet I also like to test the right brain and I found, um, I found as I began to learn about wine, which was right after graduating from university and getting out and starting to earn a living, I found that some of the more uh, um, hedonistic things in life uh, had great value. And I found that wine was one of the few that was both hedonistic and uh, went after the soul, but also um, had its best reflection um, in the hands of people who were highly technical, and so uh, even though uh, even though you need to be creative to I think to make a wine that stands out to make it year after year, you have to technically be astute to know what variables are making what influences on the wine, and so I it didn't take me long to realize that. Um, the technical and the romantic side of wine were somewhat uh, intertwined if, if done well. I also realized that uh, in the place that I happened to be at the time, which was uh, soon thereafter, because it wasn't, it wasn't immediately after school, but within another four or five years, I found that I was here in Oregon and we had an industry uh, beginning, uh, the first phase of pioneers had at least begun planting some things, and this was like 78, 79. Uh, I became interested in what was going on here, and then finally in 1980 we found the perfect piece of property, and that was the beginning of what we're doing now. Which property was uh, that? It's a vineyard called Ridgecrest Vineyards, and it's on Ribbon Ridge. It was the first vineyard planted in what now is an AVA, Ribbon Ridge AVA. And it's at, uh, I'm trying to remember that. It's That's the, the top of the hill there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, Ridgecrest is at the crest of Ribbon Ridge, okay. uh, at the very top. It's about 692 feet. Uh -huh. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that you mentioned, you said, uh, you know, it's like, um, like the wine was hedonistic. I'm trying to remember what you said. It's like it was mm -hmm. hedonistic, but yet there was like, like a, um, you mentioned the soul. And right. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of curious about that. I can understand well, the hedonistic. Outcome. Well, I, I I think the the hedonistic allows us to ap approach uh, some of the um, amorphous um, areas of life that end up being appealing, but that we can't put words around, or that we can't uh, necessarily look, put our fingers on. Uh, I think that is uh, sometimes those sensations of greatness in wine or in a food or in people end up being somewhat ephemeral. Mm -hmm. And for uh, for us to 
continually search for for uh, that um, I don't know it's almost a pretense uh, to perfection uh, I, I think should uh, should drive a lot of people and I think uh, it's a great it's a great marriage of technical and romantic the roman and romantic doesn't really capture that uh, more in-depth soul nature of, of what what wine is all about I, I even think in and even though I don't like to emphasize it, uh, one of the things that drove me to wine is uh, a general sense that wine, more than most things in life, uh, approaches immortality. I don't think we are immortal, but I think some of the things that we do in life uh, can uh, qualify for at least some degree of immortality. So, so good acts and wines that will live 20 or 30 years after we're gone are good things to do. Uh -huh. Okay. So the immortality is in the wine itself. It's like you've left mm -hmm. something, like, like something, something behind. Yeah. yeah. It's like leaving a piece of literature, or like uh -huh. leaving a musical work or an art piece. And I think here we we like to associate art and wine. We like to think that what is in the bottle is a piece of art in its own right. Mm -hmm. uh, in what way? Uh, it's once again uh, focusing on replicating it using technical sk uh, skills, but in creating it using the right brain skills, the skills of the hedonist, uh -huh. the creative, uh, the creative side. Yeah, and when you're saying creative, well, let, let me ask you a second. So, what does the winemaker bring to the bottle? Um, it depends on. It depends on the winemaker. I think the winemaker can be uh, merely a, a technical, uh, uh, a, a technical being who who husbands the wine through uh, a rigorous set of steps that make certain that there aren't faults, uh -huh. and make certain that everything that was in the grapes can come out. Yeah. I think the winemaker also can be someone who is. Uh, ultimately creative and pulls uh, an essence of, of him or herself out of the wine. So there, uh, he or she puts a, f a fingerprint on the wine itself. I think a mixture of the two is the ideal. If you can have the same, uh, if you can have both of those in the same person, I think that's the ideal. You need both aspects. You need a creative, oh my God, this is a great wine. But you need to be able to say that in a second vintage, in a third vintage, in a fourth vintage, in a fifth vintage. The technical allows you to do that, to, re to replicate things. Uh -huh. Yeah, but isn't there like the variable, you know, it's like this year was kind of an interesting year in terms mm -hmm. of uh, uh, like weather. Right. You know, you, so you have like all these variables, and so like those are challenges. Where does right. that fit into uh, uh, like the winemaker's role? That's, uh, that many times uh, taxes the technical winemaker more than uh, than the artistic winemaker, huh. um, mainly because uh, that then says, okay, what do you know about how to deal with years like this? How do you adapt? How do you um, how do you take the fruit that potentially could be underripe and maximize the ripeness? How do you take uh, the fruit that, uh, if it hangs too long, may uh, get botrytis and make certain that doesn't affect things? What do you do when you bring it in and you find it does have some botrytis? What technically can you do to make that a, no, uh, a, a no, of no concern? Yeah. So it's the technical side. At the same time, in a vintage like this, we also, uh, I think, even this year have uh, proven that the creative winemaker also is there too. Uh, we, for example, this year brought in some fruit, uh, some Riesling that is uh, by some people's standard an underripe Riesling. Uh -huh. We brought it in from our highest elevation vineyard. It was in great shape. It had good flavors. Riesling has two different peaks of aromatics and flavors that come that come along, unlike uh, most other grapes where there's just a single uh, upswing towards a, an apex of uh, flavor and aroma. Yeah. With uh, with Riesling, there's one about 
18 bricks and then there's another around 21 bricks and we actually brought some fruit in at both of those peaks but the earlier one we said okay now what in the hell do we do with this stuff yeah and so in a creative sense uh, um, the two winemakers sat down and said shoot let's make a sparkling wine out of it it's got great acidity we can ferment it to a certain point we can balance it uh, we can do something we haven't done before so it's a good example of uh, a year that's challenging but with the challenges come opportunities to do things that you haven't done before yeah one of the things um Somebody mentioned that I should ask you about weather. Oh. So apparently you're um, a student of weather. Well, I'm, I'm a number nerd, so I... You're I, like number nerd. Oh, oh. I basically have analyzed data for a long time. I uh -huh. did that in manufacturing industries for several uh -huh. years. So it was a, an, a tool that was used in the departments that reported to me. Uh -huh. And uh, so technically... Uh, uh, I love to look at data, and so it's natural in a, especially in a cool climate uh, like we have here in the Willamette Valley, it's important to understand weather because the climate itself gives the nuance, gives the great acidity, gives the food friendliness to the wines that we grow here. Yeah. And um, if you know the distinctions between years, and what they then result in, as far as the finished wines, you can, to a certain de degree, uh, become a prognosticator of, of the next vintage. You can learn how to adapt early on. Uh, if you know that you're in advance by two or three weeks of where you normally are at a certain time, then you can assume that you're going to have a fairly ripe vintage. If in a ripe vintage, say, uh, you also know that you've set a good crop, then the question is, should you drop a certain amount of the crop as you normally do, or should you leave extra? You can anticipate uh, that it would, be a, uh, it would be a good idea to stretch out the growing season as far as possible, so you might want to leave more crop load on. Uh -huh. Or the opposite is also yeah. true. If you're behind and you aren't ripening as quickly and you aren't accumulating heat, which again we can measure on a daily basis and have some statistics that we actually plot out, uh, then you can say, oh, we better drop more crop than normal so that what's left actually gets ripe or else the rains may, came, may come and we'll have less than optimal quality. So based on, based on heat units, based on uh, how we're tracking for a year compared to uh, averages from the past, we can uh, we can definitely see how best to adapt to, uh, in a specific vintage. It also gives us a view that a lot of people don't have who aren't as sensitive as the wine industry is, and especially in a cool climate. Uh, we also have a view of climate change, and we have been blessed within the last uh, 10 or 12 years with uh, 10 or 11 years with. Uh, some excellent vintages. There have only been two or three that have uh, been a little bit challenging and only a little bit for, uh, for I think, the three that we've had. Uh, it's a blessing, but it's a mixed blessing because it's being, I, I guess I like to use the metaphor of the train. It definitely has been brought by this train, but we haven't stopped the train, and the train's going to keep going, and we're going to be left with uh, more of a good thing if more heat is a good thing uh -huh. and uh, and so sooner or later we're gonna have to deal with having our cool climate change to a warmer climate and it's already happened the for example I can show you some interesting graphs um, that reflect uh, cumulative degree days which is a way of tallying up the amount of heat we've had in a growing season Mm -hmm. And you can look at the last 11 years and compare it to what the 30-year average is from, say, 1960 to 19, 1961 to 1990. And you can see in the last 11 years, we've had uh, all vintages at the average or above average 
of what was seen in that 30-year period. So what it says is that um, we normally would expect if, if, uh, if, if, uh, if chance is alone involved, we would expect one out of every two times it to be above or below. Uh -huh. for, it, for 11 in a row to be at average or above, uh, the probability is very slim that there hasn't been uh, a change actually uh, taking place. That's assuming like the, the cycle is a short cycle. Like if the cycles are actually in fact very long cycles, let's mm -hmm. say they're over periods of say 200 years or something right. like that, then... Uh, right. I'm kind of curious. Yeah, that, uh, that is true. It depends on the, on the, on, on the cyclic nature. Uh, it depends. Uh, obviously, we could all choose whatever period we want to look at and prove what we want potentially, or at least debunk uh, some of the more recent findings, uh, I choose to play it safe. Uh, I know that we've warmed. I know that uh, uh, from looking, and we, we've got data that's been dug up from various, uh, not stuff that we've d dug up, but uh, we're, we're lucky enough to have one of the top two or three um, climatologists uh, focused on the wine industry, living in the state of Oregon, he's down in Southern Oregon. Greg, Dr. Greg Jones, and he is pretty amazing. Uh, his grasp of the topic, and even though he's the last one to want to um, call people to arms, he's a scientist purely. Uh, what he what he has dug up from the last couple thousand years, as far as uh, some of the ages we've gone through, it still scares the living hell out of me. Huh. Uh, like, we, like what? Well, uh, the, the, the fact that we are warming and at a pace to where uh, we may still be growing grapes, but we won't be growing the type of grapes that we have here and uh, right now, and they may not even be cool climate grapes, and that within the next hundred years. And so... Huh one would say, okay, maybe it is a long-term trend. What is it going to, what, what is it uh, in the cycle that's going to break the cycle and cause us to go back, uh, go back and start cooling off again? Uh, Assuming one, that there is such a thing. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It may not come, and if it is, it might be cataclysmic. Yeah. And I don't, I personally don't want to see it. I'd rather slow things down right now and hopefully stabilize things. So I, I have a passion about the topic, and a lot of, despite the fact that our industry has benefited short term over the last 10 to 15 or 20 years, uh, long term nobody's going to benefit from it continuing. Yeah. So what what is that uh, in your thinking process about what you should do in the next say 10 years? You know, I'm assuming that you're thinking out ahead. Right. What, what, what well, there, there, there are two areas for activity. One is to to adapt to the changes that are occurring as an industry. Adapt in what way? Uh, yeah. And the second is to uh, is to work at a more global solution for slowing. Uh, the progress of uh, climate change. So one is something that's within our control and within our industry, and the second is something that each one of us as individuals has to work on and that we have to shake the, uh, shake the heck out of people in D.C. and uh, around the world to get people to realize the peril that we're in. On the first one, the one that we can do something about as a smaller subset of the population, uh, our adaptation is already beginning whether people realize they're adapting to climate change or not. There's great interest in varietals that are, guess what, warmer style varietals like Tempranillo, uh, uh, Syrah, uh, interest in some parts of the state uh, in Grenache, some other varietals, uh, Nebbiolo, mm -hmm. uh, varietals that end up being um, definitely something that if you were planning to go to a warmer climate, you would start investigating those. Yeah. 
those varieties. In addition, we have a lot of people pushing the boundaries as far as growing regions. We're pushing into the Cascade foothills uh, and also into, um, into the coast range foothills, going into cooler areas where uh, it's historically not been seen as appropriate to plant there. At one point, when I planted my vineyard in Ribbon Ridge, uh, besides one or two vineyards that were in the McMinnville area, that was as far west as anybody had planted. And the general wisdom at the time was you don't want to go farther west because it's just too cool in the rain shadow or in the shadow of the coast range. You're going to get into areas where you're not going to be able to ripen your grapes. Hmm. And so uh, that's within my 30 years. Yeah. Uh, the, when you were making the decision mm-hmm. to plant there, mm-hmm. the thought process, I mean, were you actually at that time aware of like, no. the trend? I mean, that was just... No, no. Was I just, had no idea. No, I, I just thought it was the right piece of property, the right soils. It was a little bit far out, and I heard what people were saying, but I said, you know, uh, I don't know of anything else, and I want to buy a piece of vineyard property. Uh And I actually kind of lucked into what I got. Uh, The other thing, and especially using the vineyard property I did get that is interesting, is that I did buy this piece of property that was relatively high in elevation. Uh It's it's up there between, six. uh, what's planted now is between about 600 feet down to about 500 feet, and that's relatively high, yeah. uh, especially 30 years ago. Now, however, one of the adaptations is that people are going up to eight, 900 feet in elevation, 1,000 feet, and finding it might be a little tough in some cool years, but most of the time, no problem whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the fruit off of high elevation vineyards is superior in vintages like 2003, 2006, and those type. Um, those, uh, those sites, the, the adaptation by going to higher elevations is significant as well as different sites in different places. The other thing, even on higher elevations one, or even on lower elevations also, uh, you can change how you're planting, uh, what your uh, uh, what your aspect is. Instead of uh, the ideal thing for us when we were planting 30 years ago, is you go as low down as you can while still retaining the soils that you want. You get on the south side of a hill, due south is perfect, and have a slope about like this, uh-huh. and don't go too far out. And now. Uh, some of the adaptations are going as high in elevation, going to weird places, and then even going north facing on some of the hills. Huh. So north facing is okay now uh, as we get out and play around some. And Wait, some of know? us have proven it. Uh, huh. That kind of surprised me a little bit because, like, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, uh, uh, and again, I'm not mm-hmm. an expert and I'm, right. just, uh, I'm real sure. not but it seems like, you know, it's like uh, come, you know, late August, September, and October, the sun's getting lower in the asthma, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I know that, you know, like, that time of the year, the sun never hits, like a north face. Uh, not, uh, well, there's definitely radiation. Well, yeah. And, uh, and do you have direct sunlight at, at the end of the day? No. Yeah. But uh, at that point in time, uh, with adequate warming, during uh, during the year, you're just wanting final ripening anyway. You're wanting hang time. You're wanting not to burn out uh, the acidity that's there. And uh, we've we've huh. found no real problems. Obviously, you do do still get uh-huh. sunlight on green uh, photosynthetic leaves. Uh huh. That's interesting. Um, tell me, you know, like what from the the data that you've looked at, if you were to kind of summarize Oregon weather. Um, if that's even possible. T- tell me about, like, Oregon weather. Or, or I, I guess I should say more specifically Willamette Valley. Uh, yeah, I, I would make the distinction between the Willamette Valley, which is a cool climate viticultural region, and some of the other parts of the state that are going gangbusters now and that grow great fruit, but there are different uh, varieties that are being focused on in places like the Walla Walla Valley or southern Oregon. So if we focus just on the Willamette Valley, we're talking here about 
a bona fide cool climate, one where you get adequate ripening, you get warm enough days, you're starting out a little bit later as far as bud break, uh, but you're also, uh, you have longer, uh, because of where we, where we are, you have longer days than say Southern California or uh, Northern California. Uh, you have uh, longer days in, in summer and mm -hmm. yep yeah uh, as much as a couple hours is it two hours uh, say on June 21st uh, two hours longer than say Napa when you're in Salem versus Napa yeah and uh, and so we're a cool climate we have warmth but we don't necessarily have 95 to 100 degrees uh, during the majority of the depth of the summer. Mm -hmm. We might have a spike or two that gets to that range, but in general, our, our warmest month is uh, August, and it's 82 degrees as an average high temperature. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's over a long period of time, so uh -huh. uh, I wouldn't doubt that uh, if we looked at just the last 10 or 12 years, that might be slightly higher. Mm -hmm. but, uh, we also get no rain. We we very much are similar in uh, in climate to California as opposed to say Burgundy mm -hmm. as far as rainfall. In Burgundy, they get pretty much the same three inches or so of rain every month yeah. throughout the year. Whereas here in Oregon, in the Willamette Valley, uh, we definitely have a bathtub sort of effect. We've got a lot of rain at the beginning of the year, and it tails down, and we have virtually none in July, August, September, and then uh, then we get a whole lot, as is evident right now in, the, in December, get a whole lot uh, at the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, it's a cool climate, and the thing that is especially good for the fruit that we grow here is that with the cool climate, uh, we have wide uh, differences uh, the, between highs and lows. The diurnal temperature swing is pretty great. We go down uh, uh, to such a low temperature that we uh, cease respiring um, uh, and converting uh, malic acid to tartaric acid. So we are retaining, uh, we aren't burning out uh, we aren't burning out the plant. We, we don't lose a lot of uh, tartaric at the end of the year in the final ripening period. We've got cool nights, warm days. What, what kind of temperature range is there? Um, and I guess, what, you're looking at September? What, what, you know? Well, August or September, yeah. yeah. It, it depends on, on whether you're talking growing season or the ripening period, which yeah. pretty much is in the end of August through September and October. Well, what kind of temperature um, range is there in that? Uh, uh, I could I could look up specifics, uh, but it's about uh, it's about uh, it's about thirty five degrees, something like that. Wow. Thirty thirty five. Wow. And I I can get you specifics. Well, I was on just kind that, of curious in yeah. general terms. It doesn't. I'm I don't know. I've, for I've, real specific. Yeah. I was just kind of. Uh, well, we have pretty wide wide uh, yeah. swings. Yeah. But I can I can look that up for you. But can you give me, you know, from your perspective, like a, a history of Oregon wine from as early as you know it to the present day. Um, like a two-minute version. Two-minute version is uh, four or five waves of uh, of people coming in to make the industry theirs. Starting starting in the uh, mid to late '60s uh, with David Lett and then uh, the Dick Eraths and the Charles Coreys and people like that. Uh, uh, most of whom are still around. Charles Curry's uh, deceased, but uh, all the rest of them are around, even though one or two of them are playing golf more than they used to, and others are <laughs> ailing a bit. Uh, so, so the industry there was set up by pioneers who had technical backgrounds, who were somewhat obstinate and sought to do things that other people uh, couldn't do and are 
in many instances still pretty obstinate individuals, those type of individuals who, uh, who wanted to go out and do something that no one else had done. Uh, those people were, f were followed by phases that, uh, of romantics, people who didn't know how to do it but knew that they wanted to do it and were in it for those sort of things then followed by people who had some resources and had the ability to like wine, uh, so it's many times the doctor's phase or the owner's of business's phase. Uh -huh. uh, we've, uh, we've also gone into a phase where, where other people in the wine industry have discovered Oregon and have come in. There's also a phase, uh, maybe the fifth phase, where, um, where I would call it, it the apprentice phase, those people who've come in to help out in established wineries now, uh, 25, 30 years afterwards, uh, help out but also begin their own thing and then eventually skip over to that. So, you know, the people like Lynn Penner Ash or the, the uh, Sam Tannehill, Cheryl Francis, the, uh, a lot of people who have started here because there was a job here and they were mm -hmm. passionate about wine, but they couldn't afford to plant their own grapes and do their own winery. And then I think the the phase that we're in right now is one of second generation. And so we're right now realizing that it isn't just a one-shot deal, that there's a second generation following. and. Uh, and many times the baton has been passed not only successfully but to uh, uh, a radical improvement even in how things were done. If nothing else, there's at least a validation of the first generation doing the right thing because the second generation, despite growing up uh, being bored silly with wine stuff, has taken it to their own bosom and yeah. are now doing it themselves. So you're thinking like, who on that? Oh, I'm, th I'm thinking the Ponzi. Adam Campbells, the Ponzi children, all three of them being involved in the winery, uh, the Broadley, uh, Scott, Scotty Henry, uh, uh, Jesse Lang. Uh, my daughter is uh, in her final year in grad school at, in enology and viticulture at Davis. Uh, she'll eventually be back. Um, so there are a lot of people around like yeah. that. Yeah, and and I, I I think that is something that, uh, uh, and, and I'm sure there are going to be additional waves after that of people coming into the industry. But uh, I I think that wave is probably the most um, I don't know heartwarming of all of them that we've seen. Mainly. Heartwarming because be, because it's it's uh, it's our children coming in and. Uh, liking what we've done and liking the life that that they had yeah growing up enough to take it on themselves yeah when you look forward mm -hmm. uh, you know I'm wondering about like the history will, will Oregon wine industry continue forward and I'm thinking like in France and Burgundy and I mean they have tremendous trem a tremendous history mm -hmm. you know and here in Oregon it's you know post prohibition uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's 40, it, well, it's 40 years. Yeah. Really, just here in Oregon, 40 yeah. years old. Yeah, and uh, and that's not a very long history. Mm -mm. When you look forward, do you think that, uh, and, and like the influences in, in America and in, in Oregon are quite a bit different than, than what's mm -hmm. in France and in right. Spain and in Italy you know, and in other right. wine-growing regions. When you look forward here in Oregon, what do you see? Um, I see that it uh, it. it it can be in jeopardy, because you're right. Because you're right in in Europe, especially in Northern Europe, where wine cultures developed, at least the farming and wine making side of things developed there. Uh, they were somewhat provincial. They were out in the boonies. Uh, people didn't necessarily try to take away what they had or insinuate themselves into Burgundy or Bordeaux or other places. Yeah. Uh, here. It isn't necessarily the that way. I think the big challenge that we've at least successfully for a period of time um, shunted off is the challenge that our beautiful countryside and our farmlands have have uh, have presented. They're so beautiful and they're so desirable that everybody wants to live here and everybody wants to plant there. 
a 6,000 square foot house on top of a hill and look down on the vineyards that they're not allowing to get close to them because they've bought up the top of the hill. Um, measure 37 uh, would, had it not been uh, mitigated somewhat, would have been an utter disaster. It would have kind of clipped, truncated the the Oregon wine industry, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we're going to continue to have battles along those lines. I mean, the Senate Bill 100 is the one that the one gave us yeah gave us the protections. Yeah. Uh, measure 37 tried to take them away. Measure 49 uh, said, okay, let's be reasonable here, and there are going to be more battles over time. And I th I think uh, I think that's the biggest th that's the biggest threat to an ongoing Oregon wine industry. That's and other people have to. I think each generation is going to have to get up and say. Hell no, you can't take it. Yeah. Sometimes I, when I drive, especially through here along mm -hmm. Highway 99, mm -hmm. and I think about like that Senate Bill 100, you know, if, if it hadn't passed, I keep looking at those hills and I keep wondering, gosh, you know, would that vineyard be here? Would mm -hmm. that vineyard be right. here? Right, and the answer is no, because you can look in some of the places where there are still packed in a lot of homes in places that are... Um, desirable commuter distances now, mm -hmm. uh, desirable areas for commuters to, to live who've got enough money to build a big house. And I, I, think, it's, I think it's scary to, to not protect vineyard lands the same as we protect bottom lands in the valley. Uh, that's one of the real successes of the 2007 legislature actually was in passing a measure 49 or to propose the measure 49 that then passed and including vineyards uh, in its class A or class 1 or whatever it is uh, 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 farmland mm -hmm. definition because yeah. up until then it was only deep dark black too rich soils in the, in the bottom land. Yeah. Now vineyards are included in that. We actually um, specified uh, what hillside areas and which valleys, which AVAs, et cetera, uh, were appropriate for reserving for vineyards. Yeah. What about uh, another influence that, that we're seeing mm -hmm. are, up to this point, Oregon has been like relatively small um, operations relatively small if you compare like to Columbia mm -hmm. Crest or something like that. Right. Um, but now we're seeing you know bigger money coming in. We're seeing a different type of uh, uh, owners uh, coming in, coming in with mm -hmm. you know money, and and, and we're seeing uh, uh, you know bigger corporations you know coming mm -hmm. in. Saint Michelle. Saint Michelle has uh, now bought Erath. Mm -hmm. We've got people like Gallo and Kendall Jackson kicking tires around from what we hear, the rumors. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we, we, we have I, I think uh, we have an industry that's going to be shifting somewhat. We're going to end up, I guess the phrase or the word is bifurcating. We're going to bifurcate the industry. We're going to have those people who... Uh, have uh, big crop circles in the bottom of the of the valley on grass seed farms, old grass seed farms that are now growing grapes to make uh, uh, eleven dollar Kendall Jackson Pinot Noir from the Willamette Valley or something like that. Oh, okay. Uh, and we're still going to have then uh, the upper crust wineries situated on the in the hills uh, that give them the reputation to be able to sell that, but at the same time it could be a two-sided thing where the $11 Pinot Noir interests enough people out there who haven't heard about Pinot Noir before that they now uh, get into the mill and eventually buy a $60 bottle of uh, Ultimate Pinot Noir. Yeah. So it could be beneficial both ways. So when you look out, like, say, mm -hmm. I don't know, 30, 30 years, mm -hmm. you know, what do you see uh, when you look out here? Um, 30 years? Yeah, 30 years. I mean, let's give it a little timeline. Right. I, I see all of these hillsides that are uh, now sub-AVAs of the Willamette Valley. I see them packed with vineyards. I see very little room in between. I see the towns 
very much wine oriented. Uh, it uh, the towns themselves being the sites for uh, for the infrastructure that tourism and the wine industry need, such as resorts and if they're going to be any. Uh, fancy homes they're going to be in those areas and not on potential vineyard sites uh, the hillsides are going to be largely vineyards with every now and then a scattered home but that usually just for the people growing the grapes it's going to be very much like burgundy where you don't dare um, plant a home up on the hillsides that's for grape growing if you're a person and you're wanting to live you live down in the town yeah. as a matter of fact most of the wineries I think will uh, or part of the wineries at least will still have the scattering of the wineries throughout the vineyards because I think that's what the Oregon uh, statutes allow and I think that's going to be a good positive so long as it doesn't get out of hand. Mm -hmm. But I think there are going to be a lot of uh, urban wineries, or not really urban, small town wineries in, in Newburgh, in McMinnville, in Lafayette, in Salem, wherever it is. Yeah. So, so I, I see that. I, I see dense, densely planted hillsides here. I think you drive from here to McMinnville, and anything that's uh, above 400 feet is planted in grapes. And where does, um, like, I hate to almost use that word global warming, but, you know, where's that trend for warming? Where does that fit into, uh, like, that scheme, the 30-year scheme? Uh, in that scheme, I, I see, well, once again, it's the adaptations we talked about before. Uh-huh. Um, I think some of the varieties that may be on some of these hillsides, if it's a warmer site and it's down low and it's got warming breezes through the uh, Van Duzer corridor or something like that, or cooling breezes, then you'll grow different things. But I see uh, varieties like Syrah and Tempranillo grown here. Uh, I see Pinot Noir still grown here, but at higher elevations and in other places like that. I see other white varieties. I, I don't think this is just red country. If you look at what we do here, uh, over half of what we do is white wine. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very appropriate. There's some varieties like Riesling that are very uh, adaptive. They've got a wide range of areas that you can grow uh, Riesling in and make exceptionally good wine of different styles. Yeah. And there are other white varieties. We're also playing ourselves with Gruner Veltliner, which requires mm -hmm. a little bit more... Oh. Uh, a little bit more heat, uh -huh. and there are going to be more things like that. Viognier, people are already uh, have already planted here, and uh, uh, some people I, some people believe that th they'll be more and more successful over time with varieties like that. So whites and reds, we're going to be moving towards more heat tolerant varieties. What about like the culture, the wine culture here? Is like I, I, I talked to like the early guys and they and I just came from Nick's you know, mm -hmm. today too, you know where people met in the back room and mm -hmm. you know shared information and things like that. And, mm -hmm. um, see, now when did you come in? Like, 1980. 1980. So that was very much in the small. Uh, I was kind of in phase in wave two. In wave two. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about the culture that was in that. The culture was a small town culture where where people banded together to uh, fend off the, uh, the onslaughts of either disease or weather or not understanding how to run a machine. Uh, I can remember, um, I, I can remember uh, working my, one of my first harvests uh, just to get my, after we had purchased our land but didn't have things going yet, working my first harvest with uh, Myron Redford uh -huh. uh, at Amity and he had Dick Ponzi over and they were scratching their heads and Dick knew how to, he's a mechanical engineer so he knew how to run things and so he was showing Myron how to, uh, how to run his press, uh -huh. his, uh, his filter. Uh, and, uh, and so it was that sort of collaborative industry that uh, was back then when people would meet in the firehouse and talk about how to do things in vineyards and uh, it's also the same sort of collaborative uh, work that went on when we began things like uh, International Pinot Noir Celebration, when we began things like the Oregon Pinot Camp. I remember the beginnings of all of those things and it was people getting together and saying we need to do something, how do we do it? Yeah. I mean we, we still have, you know, 
Oregon Pinot Camp, which is an utter success and has been going for eight years now. Um, we still have almost, well, we do, do still have everybody on the board of that who created it. I mean, we've got old farts like myself and Pat Dudley and Dave Adelsheim and Susan Sokol Blosser. You can just kind of run down the names of the people who you think have adequate gray hairs, and they're there still. So it's, it's a, the collaboration is Oregon. It's the one thing that when people leave after having gone through an event here in Oregon, they go back saying, those people actually like each other. Uh -huh. They aren't competing, they're collaborating. Even though like the personalities are really strong, sometimes abrasive, um, they may be abrasive as far as getting a job done, but uh, and sometimes they don't understand each other, but uh, there is always uh, a desire to work together and be inclusive rather than be exclusive. Uh -huh. And that's Oregon. Oregon wants to involve everybody and do things together. One of the, one of the big hazards uh, to that, besides bringing in mammoth corporations who don't think that way, uh, and that is a, a hesitation I think a lot of us have. Uh, one, one of the one of the problems with growing bigger as an industry is that we can't get everybody in the firehouse anymore. We can't get everybody in. We, we do a, a wine symposium down in Eugene, or have done, we kind of reinstituted, we took what Oregon State had as great days and we, we reformed it into a very powerful industry session once a year from a technical standpoint over two or three days. We can't get everybody in uh, the Hilton and the, and the, the buildings there to house us anymore. We're going to have to go to the convention center or places like that in the, in the near future. So the industry size may put a damper on the collaborative Oregon spirit. However, I don't think it's going to happen because we, whether we did it for this reason or not, I think the new AVAs, for example, in the Willamette Valley are serving to uh, serving like the industry or, yeah. they are appearing like the industry did 30 years ago. In what way? They have successfully taken a large concentration of wineries and vineyards, uh, you know, two or three hundred, three hundred wineries and um, uh, six hundred vineyards, uh, where you couldn't get them all together, you couldn't get unanimity, uh, couldn't even get consensus. Um, and what it's done is broken in, into at least six pieces. And so now Ribbon Ridge has, uh, has about 20 uh, vineyards and wineries. Can 20 people get in together and do things collaboratively? You bet your butt. Yeah. Uh, the Dundee Hills, the Eola Hills, uh, they are now manageable sizes to where people can actually sit down together, uh, put together their heads. Uh, or would one AVA now be semi-competing with another? Yeah, there's going to be a little bit of that. But in general, uh, people now know that uh, if you stick together, you're going to be a lot more powerful than if you try to do it alone. And so you're, what, you're, what I'm hearing you say, and I just want to confirm this, is like that, that sense of cooperation. You're still feeling that sense of cooperation, even on a, uh, a whole uh, area rather than just a, an ABA area, like the whole Willamette. The whole Willamette Valley, and actually it's about 25 times better than it has ever been in the state of Oregon right now, despite the fact that there are lots of diverse regions going. We've done a very good job, and I'm on the Oregon Wine Board, so I've had firsthand experience of this. Uh, we've done a great job of unifying the state as uh -huh. opposed to having fractionalized state wine industries going on. Uh, we now have uh, a, a unified effort. Oregon is a name and a brand that's being sold. People realize that it's Willamette Valley Pinot Noir that maybe is the engine right now, but it won't always be. And uh, you can tag along with that, and you can still sell your Merlot from Walla Walla. You can still sell Tempranillo from the Umqua. 
it's going to be great. Yeah. So uh, I, th I think we still have that collaborative spirit, and I, th I think it's actually better statewide than it's ever been. And the ABAs make it good, even in the localized Willamette Valley areas. So you're still feeling that, that cooperation? Oh, yeah. In, in all the things that I'm on, and I'm on about 10 different boards, it seems like, uh, it's still there. Yeah. Everybody is working together for a common good. That's kind of interesting because, like, you know, like you've got bigger and bigger things coming in, you know, and, and I, I, I keep thinking, well, that's going to be changing, like, the atmosphere and changing, like, the culture. Mm -hmm. There's a potential for that, but the, there is also great knowledge in how to prevent that from happening. Uh, and and, and great that's knowledge. well, we've worked collaboratively enough. We've seen enough instances of people who potentially could be um, monkey wrenches in the gears, uh, who who buy and and the main the main way to keep them from doing their own things and uh, being a competitive asshole. Uh, is to bring them in and let them taste firsthand what collaboration is all about. So you get them involved, you get them active. Yeah, who, who are you thinking? No, nah, I'm not going to name okay. Gary Anderson's name um, uh, or other people. Uh -huh. um, you've been in the, uh, in the vineyard for what, like 20, 27 years or so. Mm -hmm. What has the vineyard taught you about life? Um, The, the vineyard every, every year teaches you about renewal, and it teaches you about... Uh, what, 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 what's, what's that mean? Renewal to me means having a second chance, or a third chance, or a fourth chance, or a 27th chance to do it right. Uh, you aren't always uh, burdened by what the last harvest has been, by uh, what the last... Uh, death of a child has been there is hope always because there's a new season you know that's an interesting perspective because sometimes I hear you know in every year you only have one chance to get it right but your perspective is it's like further mm -hmm. it, um, it's like well maybe we didn't get it right this year but yeah next but year next year is the time to optimize it even more yeah. Well, maybe it helps that I grew up a Philadelphia Phillies baseball fan. Oh. <laughs> and so based on that, it was always wait until next year. So it's, uh, maybe it's a masochistic, uh, optimistic view. So that's giving you a real long-term kind of a vision. <laughs> yeah, that's right. that's right. Sometime in the next century, we'll win a pennant. So 30 years is nothing. <laughs> yeah. What about, you know, it's like in that time is like I'm sure that you've had some kind of thing that has been just a real success, something that maybe you've tried and it just really worked. Tell mm -hmm. me about tell me about that. Well I I um I think once again it that can fall either on right brain or left brain. Uh -huh. it, it can be the technical rigor uh precisely giving us every chance to succeed even in challenging years and I think 2007 is a great will be a great example of that where it, it uh, is indeed a challenging vintage but I think we're going to make some fantastic wines out of it um, another uh, one of the other examples that I gave earlier about making sparkling wine uh -huh. you know, it's, it's the old uh, if you've got lemons make lemonade uh, several years ago uh, we were having difficulty as an industry getting people converted to uh, converted back to Chardonnay after some rather lackluster uh, Chardonnays were produced here in the early years. And the way we did that, uh, uh, or the the way it the way it happened was that we were saddled with poor clones of Chardonnay that once we realized that, and Dave Adelsheim takes a lot of uh, credit and should for, uh, uh, for identifying that as a problem and then facilitating work through Burgundy to get Dijon clones over here. Once we had the Dijon clones, then we had to convince people, hey, wait, 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 this is good Chardonnay. And, the, and we were working on it collectively once again. We have a Chardonnay group, Dijon clone, barrel fermented Chardonnay, uh, seven or eight of the best people working there. 
Uh, so we were sell selling that at the time. Um, go ahead. Uh, oh, that's okay. We were selling, uh, we were trying to uh, interest people in Dijon Clone Chardonnay in barrel fermented style. And uh, so we were building up uh, some backlogs of Chardonnay. We have planted it. We know it's good stuff. We know eventually it's going to take off. Uh -huh. And uh, it, as it turns out, it, of course, is, is taking off now. When, when was finally. that? What year was that 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 started? That we began that? Yeah. 99, 2000, that we began the actual effort to begin collectively looking in each other's vineyards and cellars and then begin marketing it together. Uh -huh. uh, the Dijon clones themselves came into production in like the mid 90s, uh, into decent production. So, 96 was the first time we did it, and you probably won't find anything earlier than 95 or 96 for Dijon clones uh -huh. out there. Uh, one of the things we realized, though, was that we still had Chardonnay that we were harvesting that we didn't quite have enough of a market for, so we decided to create what we were drinking when we went into restaurants, which is bright, fresh, zingy Chardonnay, so many times Chablis and things like that. And so we said, let's make something like that and interest people in it. So we began uh, stainless steel fermented Chardonnay, uh, and the Dijon clones fit in well because they showed ripeness, they showed uh, great fruit and spiciness, and, and yet uh, they still retained acidity, they got ripe. So it was perfect for our experiment. We experimented in a, on a large scale and didn't get shot down on that, got larger the next year. So suffice it to say that this last harvest uh, we're making as a small winery, we're making 7,000 plus cases of a stainless steel fermented Chardonnay that we huh. began in 2002 huh. with about 1,400 cases. Yeah. And, uh, and we didn't know whether it was going to be successful. We knew that we liked, we liked it and it was the type of thing that we would do. So that's an example, I think, of what's still possible here in Oregon. We can still have uh, outlandish ideas uh, start something huh. new and then have a chance to possibly even market it. We now have about seven or eight of our uh, fellow wineries who are doing the same sort of wine. Yeah, uh, They're calling it different things. We call ours Enox, uh, which is stainless steel basically in uh -huh. European terms. Huh. Now that's, that, that's kind of a, a success in industry. Mm -hmm. uh, what about you personally? I mean, you know, something that you know, like maybe you just before you go to sleep, you think, "Oh, that'd be a great idea," uh, or uh, you know, it's good. maybe combining that right and left brain, there's there's something that uh, that you just had to try, and then it really worked. Well, I I think the Enox is one of those. I mean, that comes in the middle of the night, that sort of thing. Um, so that was something that uh, you know, it's like you were. We've got to do something. What about this? What am I doing? Um, there are other examples similar to that, but there are some that are personal issues where after 27, 28 years, um, my personal view of success is actually being able to live up on the original vineyard that I bought uh, 27 plus years ago, uh, and hopefully over the next year I'll be able to do that. So that's that's a personal success. Yeah. yeah. And uh, probably a greater personal success would will be having my daughter join us here and kind of uh, taking at least part of the baton or taking at least one of the laps. Yeah. Well, that must feel really good. It will. Yeah. yeah. I bet. Mm -hmm. I bet. What about, you know, like something that was um, like, I don't want to use the word disaster, but something that is just was kind of like, a, oh, wish that hadn't happened kind of a moment. Mm -hmm. Well, there have been some disaster moments, but uh, I won't talk about those. Um, um, some, usually it happens around people, and so it might be people deciding to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, we're kind of a family uh -huh. here, and so there have been occasionally people who, for one reason or another, have uh, 
and they're all still close friends, but uh, when individuals leave, it always is uh, a mix. Uh, it's, it's a mixed blessing. It's a blessing for them to go off and do their own thing. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, it leaves a hole that is always there, but that you kind of bring other people into the mix, and it ends up being just as rich later. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's really hard to get good people. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's hard to identify good people, and I don't think people should jump to, to pick a person. Uh, I, I think you need to wait and, and uh, let the person kind of identify themselves to you. Uh -huh. You know, if, if you were to give advice to, to let's say, these readers of, of this book about how to go about tasting wine. What advice to give to readers of this book about tasting wine? Right. Um, first piece of advice would, uh, would be to have the wine with food. Wine is designed to go with food. It's supposed to be a compliment. It's not supposed to be an alcoholic beverage to get a buzz on. It's supposed to be a, a part of the meal. Sometimes, though, that can be a little intimidating. It's like pairings. Pairings are a big deal, you mm -hmm. know, right now. And people are afraid, okay, now, okay, I've got this white wine. Well, you know. that, that goes in to number two, and that is listen to only a little bit that other people tell you. Uh, listen enough to get at least some guidance, but then uh, decide for yourself what you believe. Uh, for example, one of the most pleasurable uh, meals that I ever had with a fantastic Riesling was, uh, I think it was some some beef tips in a cream, or in a, like a stroganoff sauce with wide noodles. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, that is not your classic Riesling. Uh, and this was an Auslesa, too, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, you have to decide for yourself what works. Uh, there are some classic uh, no-nos and some classic uh, thumbs-up that you will eventually find, but don't worry about it. Uh, you need to drink what you like. If you like white Zinfandel, keep drinking it, until. but keep experimenting, too. I guess that's number three is keep trying other wines that you haven't had before from other regions. <coughs> and if some of the people reading the book are winemakers, uh, the fourth piece of advice is don't drink your own wine. Hmm. Uh, if you go out for a meal or if you go and, and fix food at home for a dinner party, the last thing you want to serve is your own wine. You're used to your own wine. You don't need to develop more of a cellar palate you possibly need to compare it to other things at some, some times, but you need to taste other people's wines. Mm -hmm. You need to develop a standard. Kind of broaden your own horizons. That's right. You know? yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that's all the questions that, uh, that I have. Is there anything else that you think I should know? Uh, not right at the moment. Um, I think those are excellent questions. <laughs>